I'm Francis Dernley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss an enormous explosion as Kyiv strikes a Russian military depot, hear about Moscow's hybrid war in the Arctic, and receive an update on the state of the Kursk operation and the munitions race. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Wednesday, the 18th of September, two years and 212 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our Associate Editor of Defence, Dominic Nichols, and dialing in from Washington, D.C., Michael Bonat of the Rand Corporation. Let's start with the battlefield situation in Ukraine and Russia. Well, thanks, Francis. And hello, folks. Let's start in Russia. Uh, Ukrainian drones successfully targeted an ammunition depot in Toropetsa. That's in Russia's Tver Oblast overnight. So this is about 300 k's west of Moscow. It's actually quite close to uh, Latvia. A number of images and films you'll see all over social media. There were huge, huge explosions, a series of explosions, at least four that I could, uh, that I could count. And then the smoke trail, there are images. It can be seen from space. Absolutely colossal uh, blast there. Now, Tver Oblast Governor Igor Rodenia said, uh, you know, another, another bid for understatement of the year, said a fire had broken out in Torepetsa uh, due to falling drone debris. But he then claimed the situation was, uh, quote, under control. So much under control that he later told the local town to evacuate. Anyway, it's thought that drones from the SBU, Ukraine's military intelligence, as well as the uh, regular Ukrainian armed forces, hit a warehouse storing ballistic missiles, including Iskander's anti-aircraft missiles, artillery, ammunition and the KAB guided bombs. I've seen reports suggesting up to 100 drones were used in the attack. Other reports suggesting five or six made it through. I don't know if the numbers are hugely relevant. We'll speak to Michael later on about quite what Russian air defence are up to. But I don't know if the numbers are, uh, are that relevant right now. Have a look at the images. It is a very, very large strike on an ammunition warehouse that was built, I think, uh, well, in the last 10 years, 2015 to 18, I think the dates. And at the time, it was vaunted as you know, it could stand up to a nuclear blast, etc., etc. Right, well, it clearly can't. Anyway, Russia's defence ministry said 54 Ukrainian drones were shot down overnight, 27 over Kursk, 7 over Smolensk Oblast, that's to the west of Moscow, bordering eastern Belarus, 1 over Oryol Oblast, a little to the south, 3 over Belgorod, that south again borders Ukraine, to north of Kharkiv. They didn't mention any drones downed over Tver Oblast, uh, which underlines, in case there's any doubt whatsoever, that things are very definitely under control. Now then, let's go into Russian-occupied Ukraine. And the Ukrainian Navy said in a statement yesterday that they'd recently carried out a missile strike on an am ammunition depots near the Russian-occupied city of Mariupol. The depot is about 10 k's southwest down the coast from the city itself. They didn't say exactly when these strikes had uh, taken place, but they say that they managed to destroy both the storage infrastructure and uh, tons of ammunition that Russia was was stockpiling there for use further north and west into Ukraine. Now, in Ukraine, the, the Ukrainian prosecutor general's office has opened an investigation into another case of apparent Russian abuse and execution of a Ukrainian prisoner of war. There are very graphic images on social media going around. Uh, I, I saw them yesterday. I think some were out or dated late Monday night. They show the body of a Ukrainian service member allegedly executed by Russian forces with a sword bearing the inscription for Kursk. I've seen numerous images showing the, uh, the individual had remnants of tape around his wrists suggesting he'd been captured, although in some subsequent images I've seen that are purported to be from Russian telegram sites, those images have been doctored to remove the tape. Got to wonder why. Now, Twitter users uh, geolocated these images to uh, Novorodivka in Donetsk Oblast. That's about 10 k southeast of Pokrovsk, essentially the furthest extent of that Russian advance that's kind of come out of Donetsk City, gone northwest towards Pokrovsk. Uh, Novorodivka is, is about there. 
commenting on this, uh, Institute for the Study of War, US-based think tank, said that this most recent allegation of Russia's abuse of Ukrainian prisoners of war is consistent with a report from March this year by the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, which documented and verified widespread abuse and executions of Ukrainian prisoners of war by Russian forces. Elsewhere uh, in Ukraine, the, the Ukrainian Air Force said they shot down 46 of 52 drones launched by Russia overnight. Uh, they say Russia also launched three KH-59 and 69 variant guided air missiles. There were civilian deaths and injuries in Sumy, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Kherson oblasts. Kiev, Mykolaiv and Dnipro Petrovsk oblasts also came under attack, but no reports of civilian casualties there. And just finally, Francis, a little, possibly a little offbeat, but we talked about it the other day, so I think it's worth an update. RNZ, Radio New Zealand, reporting that AUKUS partners, Australia, uh, UK and US, said in a joint statement to mark the third AUKUS anniversary yesterday that they're in discussion with Canada, Japan and New Zealand about potential collaboration on defence technology projects. Now, this is the so-called AUKUS Pillar 2. That's the high-tech research and development bit, not the nuclear submarine bit. That's that's Pillar 1. And in that, it's only the UK US and Australia. New Zealand, uh, you'll remember, has a long history of being nuclear free, so so wouldn't be involved, won't have anything to do with uh, with Pillar 1. But Pillar 2 is very interesting, that the R&D bit. And this news comes after Canadian Defence Minister Bill Blair said earlier this month on a visit to Tokyo that Canada was in talks with AUKUS as well about joining such projects, although gave no no details. New Zealand's Foreign Minister Winston Peters said the discussions are, quote, a continuation of New Zealand's careful, deliberate exploration under successive governments and what engaging with AUKUS Pillar 2 would mean for us as a country in strategic and economic terms. So I think he's a fan. But yeah, so interesting. Pillar, I've always thought Pillar 2 is the, the, the one to watch. Pillar 1 is very, very arresting, you know, nuclear subs and all the rest of it. But I think Pillar 2 and the wider... Uh, again, possibly another question for Michael later. The wider family of like-minded nations who are willing to you know, lift the kimono and share some very, very sensitive R&D, I think Pillar 2 is one that we really, really do need to uh, to keep an eye on. And that's us up to date, Francis. Well, thanks very much, Dom. Let's have a look then at the political situation in the last 24 hours. A grisly milestone was passed this week with the Wall Street Journal citing Western intelligence estimates that around one million people have now been killed and wounded in the war in Ukraine. I wanted to start there and just pause for a moment to reflect on that. One million people with an estimated 80,000 Ukrainian dead, a number that could be considerably higher. The last official announcement from Kyiv was just over 31,000, I believe, but that was widely considered to be way off the mark when Zelensky said it a few months back, as one would expect, given that countries rarely announce true casualty figures in times of war. And as Dom just made out, there's very little sign of the violence abating. Some of the largest battles of the entire conflict are taking place right now, and there are stories of war crimes being committed almost daily, such as the one we were just talking about. The news about storm shadows, too, is still going on in the background, rumbling away. We'll have to await the UN General Assembly to see if there is any movement. Don't expect any announcement to necessarily be made on the floor of the UN in New York, however. When we were there last year, it was very obvious that the speeches there are rarely for major announcements, but simply to state already established positions with the important conversations taking behind closed doors. So I imagine if there is to be some sort of announcement, some sort of statement following Zelensky's high profile conversations, I'd expect it to be just after. But as I say, it could be wrong. They could decide to do it on the floor of the UN. But nonetheless, that seems to be rarely the model that's followed. On that debate about red lines and weapons positions, I wanted to flag a piece by Peter Dickinson of the Atlantic Council, which makes excellent observations about the degree to which Putin is becoming entangled in his own red lines. As Peter writes, he warned Western leaders that any decision to let Ukraine use long range weapons on Russian territory would put NATO at war with Russia. There is one obvious problem with this latest threat. Ukraine is already using the weapons in question to hit occupied region that Putin considers Russian, including Crimea, without provoking any escalation, never mind war between Russia and NATO. 
Judging by Putin's latest red line, therefore, it would appear that he is also not yet fully adjusted to the new territorialities championed by his own propaganda. So just to add a tangent to that, either those are no longer true red lines or Putin doesn't recognise occupied and annexed territories as truly Russian. Logically, it cannot be both. An interesting point, I think, which deserves to be drummed home in these conversations, given the nature of the pronouncements that Moscow has made for well over a year now about how it supposedly perceives the occupied territories as belonging to them forevermore. Whereas, in fact, if that were true, then they would already be, as a result, as Peter says, at war, NATO being they there, because of the (laughs) fact that they are already currently being um, struck by these weapons quite frequently, particularly Crimea, of course. Now, another interesting story is that the EU is preparing to raise up to 40 billion euros in loans for Ukraine without the US, according to the Financial Times. Budapest keeps disrupting plans on the joint loan with the US, the papers report on the 16th, citing sources and a draft proposal. So some countries are seemingly going it alone or going behind the back of Hungary. This is just an example, if one were need, of how damaging it is to have Hungary controlling the current presidency of the European Union at present. They can help dictate the agenda and the nature of the conversations. Hence why figures like Ursula von der Leyen and others seem determined to bypass them with, as re- Roland reported yesterday, pro-Ukraine figures now being appointed to lead on the diplomacy and defence side of things. For the first time in history, the European Commission will include the position of a defence commissioner. It's quite a noteworthy moment, and particularly because it's the former Lithuanian prime minister, a very hawkish country. So it shows how the mentality of the European Union as an institution is shifting towards a more hawkish direction as a response to the war. But by goodness, has it taken quite some time. But interesting nonetheless. Now, some other announcements. Germany is pledging over $110 million in winter aid for Kyiv, since Russia is, as it says, once again planning a winter war with the aim of making the lives of people in Ukraine as terrible as possible. So clearly a sharp reaction to some of the concerns around just how bad this winter could be, given the targeting of energy infrastructure by Moscow in itself what many would perceive as a war crime, given that it will mostly be civilians that are affected. Italy will also deliver promised SAMPT or SAMPT air defence systems by the end of September. Again, speaking to the urgency of the situation. Now, in yet more evidence of hybrid warfare, Instagram and Facebook owner Meta is banning RT and other Russian state media networks from its platforms over claims they carried out covert operations to influence social media users. I know we touched on this very briefly yesterday, but it was a breaking story. So I just thought I'd go into a little bit more detail about what was said in that story and indeed the reaction from Moscow. So the ban announced on Monday will globally block the accounts of RT from Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp and Threads users over the coming days. Meta said in a statement, after careful consideration, we expanded our ongoing enforcement against Russian state media outlets and uh, then went further in restricting material on accounts. In response, RT has told Sky News that Meta was censoring information flow to the rest of the world. Don't worry, where they close a door and then a window, our partisans will find cracks to crawl through, RT said. It's cute how there's a competition in the West. We can try to spank RT the hardest in order to make themselves look better. So (laughs) quite a punchy response. I think many will be asking why it's taken quite so long for RT to be banned by those organisations, given the importance that supposedly put on fake news and combating it at present. You can't really find any entity in the world that's more of a propagator of fake news than RT. And that's not a partisan point of view. They just... So much of the analysis that's done of what RT broadcasts is clearly fabrication and factually inaccurate. And if facts count for anything, then you have to dismiss RT. This isn't a subject of censorship. Rather, this is an organisation that is repeatedly and as part of its ideological underpinning, pumping out deliberate conscious disinformation to destabilise the West and to strengthen its hand in Kyiv. So it is not legitimate journalism that's being closed here. It is arguably security Um, threats. And so you have to be able to distinguish between what is rampant and deliberate disinformation and what are just simply legitimate points of view that people just happen to disagree with. And I think those are separate points with it's all about the intention at the end of the day. And it's all all about the 
foundation in fact or lack thereof. But I know that some people get upset around this issue, but I think that there is an important distinction that has to be made, has to be made between disinformation and free speech, because otherwise you really are making yourself very susceptible to what can be very, very harmful narratives. Now, uh, just to end, since we're talking about disinformation and Russia's hybrid warfare, I said earlier in the week that I'm trying to flag a few long reads that um, wasn't able to talk about last week. A fascinating one in The New Yorker called Russia's Espionage War in the Arctic. Huge read this, but it goes into very specific detail about what's going on in Norway with the way that Russia is probing there and how what were formerly classified as fishing boats were no longer became fishing boats, but were clearly entities that were being used for all sorts of malicious purposes by Moscow. One minute there were older sea folk who were clearly doing um, uh, fishing and then the next day were sort of young men who weren't able to talk about what they were doing when they were asked uh, uh, questions of them by the Norwegian authorities and the piece just looks at the degree in which hybrid warfare has been escalated in Norway and other places it's a really really fascinating read so for anyone who's following this particularly I highly recommend it and an interesting quote I think that just sums up the state of hybrid warfare at the moment is in the piece quote it now countries throughout Europe now acknowledge that their people and infrastructure structure under ceaseless attack. Yet each incident is by itself below the threshold that would require a military response or to trigger Article 5. In recent months, agents of Russian intelligence are believed to have assassinated a defector in Spain, planted explosives near a pipeline in Germany, carried out arson attacks all over the continent and sabotaged subsea cables and rail lines. A Russian operative injured himself in Paris while preparing explosives for a terrorist attack on a hardware store and US intelligence discovered a Russian plot to assassinate the CEO of one of Europe's largest arms manufacturers. So, again, this is a really, really detailed piece. I'm hardly doing it justice here at all, but it just looks at the very, very subtle ways in which Moscow operates in entities like Norway to sow discord, probe and to gather intelligence and as well as trying to um, destabilise through disinformation narratives, commemoration of Soviet Soviet um, victories or historical events that took place in Norway that's clearly in some way being encouraged by the Kremlin in order, as I say, to encourage certain narratives in the country that might be considered harmful to Norway's own interests as a Western power. But I'd say we'll have a link in the show notes to the piece by the Atlantic Council and indeed that piece there in The New Yorker, which is a fascinating long read on the subject of hybrid warfare. So that's where we are in the political realm at present. Now delighted to welcome back to the podcast Michael Bonnet of Rand Corporation. Michael, always a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Much appreciated. Last night, as Don was reporting there, another long-range attack by Ukrainian drones. We've often seen them used against energy facilities. So there may be a reason why such places were not adequately covered by air defence. But why is Russian air defence so poor at protecting very valuable military sites, such as this ammo dump in uh, Toropetsa? It seems quite striking just to see the, uh, the means in which... Kiev is better at deflecting some of these attacks on its military infrastructure versus what Moscow is capable of. Why is there that discrepancy as far as you're concerned? But welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for having me back, Francis and Dom. Russia has structured their entire air defense umbrella very differently. So where your Ukraine's has been very much designed to deal with Russia's over the years. Russia's has been built up over time. So a lot of their shorter range air defenses, the ones that are, you know, smaller and what you would use to fight these drones were actually all designed to shoot um, like A-10 Warhogs, Tomahawk missiles, etc. Whereas their longer range air defenses that you always hear touted are designed to go after bombers, high altitude fighters, etc. and aren't really useful. So I know this is a little bit of a history lesson, but after Allied force, so the bombing of in Kosovo and Yugoslavia, Russia did a massive binge on buying these long range air defenses but heavily neglected their short range air defenses. So what we're seeing is when you look at these small drones, they're very hard to see detection ranges at best or um, one or two miles, so four kilometers tops. Most of the missiles, they either shoot way too far or way too close. So there's this little niche where all these drones are able to get through just because Russia really has been preparing for them the way that uh, Ukraine has been forced to. And given the vastness of Russia, how far they've spread out their equipment, 
it's really hard to do nationwide coverage, especially against these small threats. And I, as, as Don always likes to plot the mill balance book, I, that's one of my sources too. And just looking at kind of their capacity, if all Russia did was defend their airfields and headquarters of units and refineries, they still would need twice as many air defenses as they currently have, just in the short range. So, you know, they have, when doing the math, about 1,500 of these short range systems. They'd probably need like 10 to 20,000 to cover the whole country. That's a warning to the West, too, because Russia has the largest stockpile of these pieces of equipment. But it comes down to these small drones are very hard to hit, and Russia is just spread out and was just not prepared for this type of a fight. Thank you, Michael. That's really interesting. Now, I know Dom's going to have some questions in a minute about thermite drones and unmanned ground vehicles, but I'd like to broaden it out first, if I may. Whenever we have you on, I always ask very similar questions on the issue of the building up of procurement capacity in Europe and indeed in the United States as a consequence of the dangers around a Trump presidency for Kyiv and just generally as part of deterrence and preparing for worst case scenarios. It's been a while since we've had our last update from you. So I'm just interested in your sense of the degree to which there have been more purchases, more um, orders made, or are we still a long way off from where we should be if the worst case scenarios were to emerge? I seem to remember you were a little bit more optimistic last time and then in previous moments, but very interested to hear your perspective on that question. So my answer is yes on this one. Yes to both. So we see, you know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Nordic countries, the Baltics, they've definitely upped their procurement. It's very clear they take this seriously. If you look at the the latest Swedish figures, they said they're going to 2.6% of GDP and spending, and a lot of that's on equipment. So we're seeing that's positive. Poland, a lot of those procurements are starting to come in, um, both missiles, um, vehicles, etc. The UK, it looks like, um, we're seeing some positive developments there. And it was announced that for U.S., for AMRAM production, so the air-to-air missiles that can be used at a surface level, are reaching full capacity. The artillery appears to be ramping up. And Patriot missiles, so more air defense, are being ramped up. So on the one hand, we see some countries have really taken great steps. And in certain select areas, mainly artillery and select sets of air defense, We've seen some improvement also in some vehicles. I can't think the name off the top of my head, but some wheeled vehicles. Production rates have jumped to 500 or more per year, which is very important. On the other hand, we're not seeing the increases in armor. A lot of air defenses still haven't ramped up. It's been commented that you know Storm Shadow and those missiles, you've not seen renewed production. So it's very spotty. And countries that I haven't mentioned tend to not be ramping up as much across Europe. So it's a mixed bag. The countries closer to Russia tend to be taking a little more seriously, and the ones that are further away tend not to. I think on some items, I'm very positive. On others, though, I'm hesitant, and I'm worried that the net capacity of Europe is still not ramping enough to recapitalize their equipment, both that they've expended and that they've not updated for the past decade. But the trends look positive. They're just about a third of the speed they should be. Fascinating. So am I, I remember, Michael, that you put together a sort of shopping list, a checklist some time ago of what you felt would be essential to keep Kiev in the fight. Were America to withdraw large moments of its military support for Kiev, if it had to be Europe that filled that vacuum? Do you feel that Europe would be able to keep Kiev in the fight in a, a military sense were that to happen? Or do you think that actually it really would force Kiev to the negotiating table, in your opinion? There's a, there's a secondary question there, Francis. If Europe is willing to do what they've done for air defense missiles and strike the way they've done for the Czech initiative, so willing to buy from some global sources, then they might be able to. They still have a window of time where they could do investments to make sure they get there. It would be tight, but it's possible. But they would have to buy from non-EU sources in the meantime. So the South Koreas of the world, other countries, I don't want to start going down a laundry list. But I'm worried in some ways, particularly on air defense, they're definitely short in production. One area where actually they might be able to make a big dent, when I put my shopping list together, I had budgeted for about 200,000 drones in it because I didn't think drones were going to be as outsized successful as they've been. 
that's something where Europe as a whole actually could ramp up production very quickly in the drone front and make up for some of what Ukraine is lacking by an increased level of drones. There are a lot of companies that make them, but they haven't been written checks yet. But those can go from productions of hundreds a year to you know, hundreds of thousands a year very quickly. So if Europe is willing to be a little more asymmetric, I think there's opportunities, particularly the UK and others that have aerospace industries still, um, I think could make a big dent. So my shopping list would change if you're willing to change that. And by globally, it's possible, but the checks still need to be written at the rate or slightly faster than they are today. I know that's a long answer, a little complicated, but there's a lot of moving parts. If only Walmart stocked missiles, Michael. But uh, thank you very much for that. Just one more question from me, which is about Kursk. Um, We spoke about Kursk together some time ago when the operation began, and we were perhaps in the first week or two of that operation. And you spoke about the significance of it for missile ranges being expanded and the potential impacts on the front lines of Ukraine itself. Indeed, that seems to have been one of the primary objectives was to try and move resources away from the fighting in the east in Ukraine and to compel Moscow to perhaps be more concerned about ensuring that its own um, resources deeper into Russia were protected. Just wanted to hear your broad assessment of Kursk, where we are over one month later, is it still very significant in the military sense? Is it, even without the weapons permissions that it was hoped to be unlocked from the West, is it still a really important operation that's having ramifications on the Ukrainian front? Or is it still in the balance in terms of being a successful or not military operation? From what I've seen, it looks like, you know, how I kind of discussed before, Russia is pulling troops from pretty much everywhere they can, with the exception of a few of the fronts and the Donbass, and even then it looks like the amount of troops have slowed going there. So it is definitely acting as a magnet, and it's very clearly taking a lot of time and and resources away that Russia was expecting to devote to the Donbass. And so we've seen that slow there. So I think, curse, we are seeing that play out as effective. Russia has very clearly pulled their fighters back, as ISW and others have covered in detail. And every time you pull fighters back, it reduces their, as we say, sortie rate. So if you pull them back 300 nautical miles, that's roughly a 30 to 40% reduction in flights per day. And we've seen from, you know, UK defense updates that glide bomb strikes are down from about 180 a day to about 120 a day. So we are kind of seeing some of these effects where the long range strike gets really important is if Ukraine is able to get their aircraft over parts of Kursk with long range strike, they can hit some of the hardened depots. So the depot that was hit last night with a drone had munitions out in the open, big mistake. They have many other areas that are buried hardened targets where these strikes, um, storm shadows, etc., are very good at penetrating into these depots where there's storage. So that's something where if long range strikes were authorized combined with fighters flying over Kursk, you could hit some of these large depots which would greatly reduce Russia's capacity for air defense and capacity for strikes because those weapons tend to be co-located in storage. So there's definitely value there. Um, From what I've seen, the limits for the Ukrainians in Kursk are more logistics than they are Russian forces and two of the three directions that Ukraine has been pushing. So that kind of shows that the lack of gear and the lack of those sustainment aspects to Ukraine are actually impacting this more than anything. The In the smaller battles, they've been very successful. Now, that being said, they, they have had some um, unfavorable battles, but overall, Kursk has proven to be destroying a lot of Russian equipment and taking the focus away. You know, we talk about these air defenses. Going back to the earlier topic, well, the long-range air defenses have to be protected by short-range air defenses. And so, because there's the potential of strike weapons hitting these long range air defenses, they're pulled back, which means the short range air defenses comes back, which means Russian troops that are at the front line don't necessarily have air defenses protecting them. So we're kind of seeing some of these follow on effects that are very helpful. And we're also seeing Russia not really able to use their air force to kind of make up for their deficiencies. So I think Kursk is still viable and very effective, even if it stalls out at some point the advantage that the Ukrainians have is they don't have to defend any towns they don't care about. 
So they're going to be able to defend when it matters to them and move when it's not and to inflict a lot of losses while preserving a lot of their own forces. So I think Kursk is going well. A lot of people, even in the first couple of weeks, were saying it's not affecting the Donbass, it's not affecting anywhere else. I think the numbers are showing that it is. We're going to have to see it, at some point in about a month or two, everything turns to mud and then it freezes. So I have a feeling that Kursk special military operation is going to slow down a little bit. But so far, I'd say it's, I think it's going pretty well. Hi, Michael. Dom here. Uh, really, really good to chat to you again, my friend. Um, a lot's happened since we last uh, since we last spoke. Let's uh, start. I'm going to dig down into the weeds shortly, if I may. But let, I'll start at the sort of top bit. Um, as, as impressive as it has been, do you think the pace of Ukrainian military innovation um, is is enough to make a difference when they're fighting an enemy that is relying on glide bombs uh, and meat assaults uh, at scale? I don't think the pace of innovation is enough. You, need, you know, we talk about this on the pod elsewhere. You need mass. And so Ukraine's able to innovate, but they're not necessarily able to scale fast enough. And this is where there needs to be some discussions with Ukraine's backers, where you know, if Ukraine comes up with a new drone that's able to take out ISR, which they've been very effective at, or a new capability for anything, the the dogs, the thermites, all of those, they do need help scaling those up. And that's something where sometimes they can scale it on their own. And the few times I've talked to Ukrainian industry, their issue has always been money, where a lot of times they have something, they have the capacity, but they don't have the money to buy all the parts and all of the raw materials they need, where if they were getting access to more money and more backers, they would be able to field instead of hundred of these thermite drones, a thousand. And so that's, that's definitely been a limiting factor for them. And some of the scaling could be done faster if it was done outside of the country, just given logistics flows, et cetera. So I think if that innovation is able to be paired with greater funds, which we're not talking, you know, the tens of billions. I mean, these are in many cases in the tens of millions to hundreds of millions to scale these up. They're much smaller scale ups. I think you could see the innovation really pay off. It's just I don't see Ukraine currently getting the resources to scale up these innovations fast enough to exploit them before Russia tries to do the same thing. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Um, now, we are down, down a little bit closer to ground level. We're going back a few weeks, but we've not properly discuss these uh, you've just been talking about them there these th- so-called sort of thermite drones these drones that have been firing well not exactly sure what the, the kind of flamethrower type type thing going along tree lines what have you do you think they're just a gimmick good for social media good for morale good for images that kind of thing or do they actually have any any real military utility well where they actually have military utility is in vietnam the, the u.s used chemicals and other, you know, defoliants to get rid of all the the trees and leaves, et cetera, to get clear lines of fire. One thing where these drones are very effective is clearing tree lines. And so if you look back and if you're in Kursk and you want to make sure you have clear lines of fire, being able to control and take down these lines of fire when you want them to, I think, Dom, you can, going back to your tank days, how valuable that would be to just remove an obstacle on demand or to make it where an, a meat assault can't advance around one axis, a, sorry, axis, because that's on fire. So it's a great way of opening up windows or guiding where people were. If we look back to the counteroffensive last year that stalled, one of the biggest reasons it stalled was dealing with the tree lines, is that they had to follow tree lines, weren't able to clear tree lines in advance, etc. And so I think part of this takes lessons learned from that offensive, where Ukraine was not able to clear tree lines fast enough to advance. So basically, it's using that you know that ability to disrupt Russian entrenchment to maneuver. So it's as thinking of it as a maneuver aid, I think it does have utility, but I mean it's not at the height of it flies and all. It's not something you're using as like a very tactical targeting tool. It's more of like a battlefield engineering tool. Yeah, and I guess a similar similar argument made for the um, the sort of remote ground vehicles, the uh, these things that we've seen rolling in Pokrovsk. Actually, we've seen them rolling into culverts. 
blowing up the culverts that support the rail lines running into Pokros in some Ukrainian action there, um, trying to stall the uh, the Russian advance. I guess that's a sort of similar thing as well. It's you know it has military utility, but there's there's significant to down downside, um, and of course it's a numbers thing as well. But um, I, I don't see that the unattended or unmanned ground vehicle drone side of the innovation has has is at the same pace as the air. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I mean, part of it too is, I mean, the ground domain is just so much harder to navigate. If you're in the air, you have a clear line of sight, which is very important for comms. You know, flying around is much easier because you don't have to do obstacle avoidance in the same way. On the ground side, you know, we, we've seen some innovation, but not a ton. However, I think that's about to change. There's a recent video from Ukraine of a walking ground vehicle that basically has a flamethrower on it designed to clear trenches. Innovation kind of going back to what was done in World War II and World War I, letting gravity and fire take care of in, uh, entrenched positions. That looks like it's coming. It's, it's been all over Twitter. So I think we might start to see the, the ground. But part of it, Dom, is the sensors you need and the autonomy you need for ground because you can't maintain that city comms means it's much harder to have them go forward and operate. It's just the physics make it much harder on the ground. Yes, I can imagine, and uh, yeah, all these. I mean, the walking things and these these sort of robo dogs and what have you. It's all very well, but they're generally filmed on a fairly benign, um, nice bit of turf. Uh, yeah, not quite, not not quite the the woods and the mud and all the rest of it. But anyway, maybe I'm doing them doing them down. A couple more for me, if I may, Michael. Just broadening out a little bit, looking beyond um, beyond Ukraine as we as we've got you. Uh, we were talking earlier on, I mentioned earlier on the, from the, the news report from Radio New Zealand about AUKUS, particularly the Pillar 2, the, the high technology research and development pillar of AUKUS. Um, in your view, how much can be shared and worked on collaboratively at that very high level, very high level of, of high tech R&D before the special source has to be watered down so much to allow other partners to come on? Where's the tipping point, do you think? So, Dom, I actually can't comment on... Um, AUKUS because I su support some efforts. So apologies on that one. But what I will talk more broadly on sharing, you know, there's a lot of agreements that are made amongst countries that are bilateral for sharing and developing technology. And from an alliance perspective, it, it can't be bilateral. The problem is there's two factors a lot of times that affect sharing. One of them is, you know, hey, are you worried about this technology from a domestic proprietary perspective? The other is just is the other country able to support the equipment to protect data and to secure it? There's a lot of money that goes into protecting secrets. And so sometimes it's not the will, but the ability of a partner. That being said, if you're doing that research in select areas that are more protected and then diffusing it later in equipment, there are other ways to get around that sharing question that you have, Dom. So I'm dodging the AUKUS because I can't, but I think that's something that isn't necessarily looked at as much as when countries want to contribute, um, there are ways where they can contribute, um, whether it's providing testing ranges or providing research on site in another country. It's just making sure that data exchange is two ways long term. That's always a problem. I think AUKUS, with its framework, has the potential to support that. But we'll have to see over time. Thanks, Michael. I'm. Uh, I do, of course, apologise. I had no idea when I asked that question that uh, that you'd be uh, you'd be Mr. Orcus, um, but one to bear in mind for the future. Um, last one for me, if I may. Again, maybe a bit bit off range, out of your patch, but it's doing all the all the, the news rounds today. This attack, alleged attack by um, well, who knows, in Lebanon and Syria, with these exploding pages, we're led to believe. I mean, technically, how? How difficult is that? Pages, very old school, exploding pages seem like something out of science fiction. Am I, am I reading that right? Or was this actually, re never mind the sort of spy craft of getting into the into the logistic line, but is it is it technically not actually that difficult to turn these things into weapons? So I was first shocked that anyone still had pagers. But I will say this, whenever something like this happens, you know, the question is, were they designed this way originally? and they were proliferated with this capability in them, or was it done after the fact? So that's kind of the first question you have to ask. Given that pagers are not terribly common anymore, it makes it easy to kind of narrow down sources. So anytime you do any anything 
that's a targeted attack like this, you have to know the system very well. And because looks like Hezbollah used the exact same pager for everybody, that was a big security fail on their side. You know, looking backwards, people always talk about cyber. People always talk about industrial sabotage. We have to remember that just a few years ago, you know, the, the whole Samsung scandal where you had people's laptops and Dells where laptops were lighting on fire all the time. If you overuse things in the wrong way, particularly these long life lithium ion batteries, there are things you can do, but every piece of technology is very different. And it takes so much knowledge to know how these are used that, you know, I don't think this is some broad risk to everybody. This was a, someone really wasn't paying attention and left themselves open to a targeted attack. I've read as much as I can, or as much as available, but, you know, I don't expect my phone to light on fire anytime soon uh, when I carry it around in my pocket. But at the same time, every battery is basically a small bomb. I mean, when electric car crashes, they burn for three to four days just because of the amount of energy density in these little metal boxes. I don't know how Israel did it yet, but I don't think that's a danger to the public. I think that's a very targeted attack by an adversary that was very complacent. Well, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Dom, for those questions and answers. Um, just one more from me, Michael, if I may. You're obviously very much focusing on things as they are at the moment, but you're always thinking ahead too. And so I just wanted to ask you the question that David always asked our guests in long interviews, which is, is there anything on your mind that should be on ours and our listeners that may not be that you're thinking about at the moment? So um, this is, it's brought to my attention recently, actually looking at just what's been going on in Russia from a finance and like actually a bond perspective and financing. So Russia's really been struggling to raise cash to actually have money to spend. Across the board, they're really struggling, both domestically in rubles, as well as international foreign exchange. So domestically, they're not able to raise cash. Internationally, they're having to use gold to deal with secondary sanctions. What this is leading to is power grid problems. Russia doesn't produce their own power grid equipment. And with these forest fires other than natural disasters, they've taken a lot of hits to their power grid. And Russia's not really been able to repair. Like some places, it's been a week before power stations are brought back online because they're not able to get the gear. And so they don't have the funding to bring people in. They're due to secondary sanctions. They're not really able to scale these things up. And there's some cascading, rolling brownouts and blackouts here and there. And I don't think anyone's really, at least publicly, doing a good job of following this lack of liquidity in the Russian system and the secondary sanctions that are affecting the ability of Russia to keep its critical infrastructure functioning. So it's a little bit out of my area, but it's something that I've been following over the past couple of weeks because there is a steady decline of, of those systems that we're seeing more and more effects. And over the next year, the secondary sanctions and the lack of imports um, that are finally taking effect, some of these other things are going to lead to Putin making some hard decisions over the next six to 12 months. I don't know where that goes exactly. I mean, he can always choose to fight on, but I kind of understand what Bunadov was saying earlier this week about looking towards next summer, because you look at the cash, you look at the ability to reconstitute forces, the all the Russian storages will have emptied out of old vehicles by next summer. All of these little bits are all kind of drawing a line to running out. And so almost like Putin, the can is you know, running out of road to travel. But I think this power grid one is something that really needs to be watched that isn't. I mean, Ukraine has stayed very, strayed very far from hitting the power grid because you know, that's Dom has spoken on the, the legality of going after a power grid. But um, just how Russia's power grid is failing on its own is something that I think we need to keep in the back of our minds to, to watch for as a potential push point for um, what Russia might have to do long term. Well, thank you, Michael. And we are very sensitive to that question, too, about the Russian economy and hope to have a very significant guest on to discuss that very, very soon. So stay tuned. Just one other thing on what you were saying there. I saw a story today and I was inclined to mention it in my section, but I thought perhaps we'd do it a little bit further in the week that Russia intends to create the second biggest army in the world with another mobilization drive. It just bears repeating that Russia may say that it has the intention to do that, but it costs extortionate amounts of money and resource. And, you know, it is not sustainable indefinitely. And I think this is yet another example of Russia seeking to put forward a strongest possible political front 
as we approach November and the possibility of things going their way in the US general election so that people say, look, you know, Russia is mobilising again and therefore we have no choice but to essentially try and uh, call time on this war. So just something to can add I, in can there. I you like, yeah. So they expanded the military by, you know, 150,000-ish um, by decree. That's separate from a mobilization. That's because Putin doesn't announce people dying in his military, he doesn't, he needs to have more billets to fill. So that's actually dictator speak for there were 120,000 more losses of troops than he's acknowledged. So whenever they yes. do those expansions, it's billet math. And so that's just kind of, we always miss that proxy effect that when they try to downplay something, it's telling us info. And that's a major info whenever the military is expanded, but we know they can't recruit more and there's no mobilization drive. That's a really clear way of saying, okay, you're, this is a way for us to quantify losses. Sorry, Francis, to jump in. It's just that's something that I think we really need to, to keep track of over the next couple of months. Absolutely, Michael. You're absolutely right. And I think the other element of this, too, is it just bears repeating that even if those soldiers have, have gone and therefore are not being paid a regular salary that they've been killed or are casualties, the fact is, is that those soldiers who are being replaced by this new mobilization are most likely their families have got extremely high payments as a result of the loss of that soldier. And that costs a lot of money. I remember doing a story a few weeks ago that was on that very point, which is just the extortionate financial cost that in order to encourage soldiers to fight, they've had to say, look, if you're killed, then your family going to get a car, your family are going to get this huge payout. And it's just another means in which even when soldiers are killed and their regular salaries are not being paid, it is a huge burden economically on the state. And it's something that, again, just plays into this economic point, which hopefully we'll discuss again very soon in detail. Thank you very much, Michael. We'll come to you in a moment for your final thoughts of today. I know it's your first time being on since David's passing. But Dom, let's start with you. Where do you want to end today? Yeah, thanks, Francis. And Michael, I've added bullet math to my uh, lexicon of new new phrases that I need to get my head around uh, for this war. I mean, a short one today from me, uh, Francis. Michael mentioned the military balance earlier on. I just wanted to give a nod to that because I do lean on it very heavily. So the military balance is the, the annual Bible, basically, of military capability. It's produced by the International Institute for Strategic Studies uh, based here in London. It's a big, thick, phone book-sized tome of, um, of, of brilliant uh, war geekery down to the numbers of different variants of everything. I lean on it heavily when I'm trying to look at how many different T-72 variants there are. So when, we, um, when you look at some reputable website saying saying how many have been destroyed you can put some sort of idea on well they, they've got a lot more but they're in storage or there's not that many more or if they're using that variant that must mean x or y so you know i just um, i just put that out there because some of the times when we when we hear these numbers as you say putin talks about another 150,000 people it's it, on the one hand you can think oh it's just, they've got they've got loads my god they can go on forever actually they can't and it's documents like the military balance that, that that show yeah the ground truth if you like so I do recommend it it's it's a it's it's not cheap <clears throat> not cheap but it is excellent so I, I have a look at the um, the double I double S for their um, products and uh, and their general reporting thanks thanks Tom Michael over to you for our final thoughts today thank you Francis and Dom but I just wanted to kind of extend on behalf of you know Rand um, to start condolences about David a lot of us here listen every day and we. We really love the the pod as it as it has helped us get through. For many of us, where we do work related to Ukraine or similar efforts, uh, sometimes it can feel like you're hitting a brick wall, or you just it can be difficult just because you feel like you're not getting traction, or you see misinformation, or other things out there. And you know the podcast like this and how David structured it really kind of gives a good reason to keep on pushing harder. And I just wanted to add one little little note is I love Tolkien as well. And I kind of, we'd always joked before without knowing David was a big Tolkien fan that this was kind of a very Tolkien-esque podcast because in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien spent more time talking about people with food and song and those sorts of life rather than fighting. And a lot of us really appreciate just how much David always tried to focus on all the other parts of society and make sure that we always remembered what we should be caring about and not what we are forced to care about. So anyway, thanks, Francis and Dom. 
Thank you very much, Michael, for those words. And thank you all very much for tuning in today. I admit it was a slightly later time um, due to there being a town hall here, which was dedicated to uh, David's memory, hence why we were later on broadcasting. But uh, we really appreciate you dialing in early, Michael. I know it's early there in Washington, D.C. We always appreciate it. Always fascinating to hear your insights. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph, created by David Knowles. To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war continues, we're relying on your support more than ever. You can get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter, now x. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Phil Atkins. Executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles.